this is the entire booklet for the gases unit. Here we go. Um, gases of different chemical properties oh, and similar physical properties. What's a chemical property? And what's a physical property? Really? Seriously? <laughs> Seriously. You have to click the pen below, I think. Yeah. No, down one. No, that's a highlighter. And this is all on the Well, that's highlighter. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that's oh, highlighter. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so restart. restart. Rewind. This is all on the middle. <laughs> Hold on. I am smarter than the machine. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Okay, chemical, physical. Okay. What's a physical property? What's a chemical property? Something that can be reversed and something that can't be reversed. Oh, okay, good. So that's a that's a change, a chemical change versus a physical change, right? So chemical changes can't easily be reversed, and physical change means it can easily be reversed, right? That's the right that's the right category. What's the property that you are changing? Oh, physical. Okay, so a, fi a physical property might be a melting point or a boiling point. If I were to describe a person's physical characteristics, their looks. Their looks. So, what do you? How do you describe the look of a chemical? Pardon? Shape by like what you see. Okay. Shape. Shape. Mm, shape of chemical. Size. Size. Size of the particle, perhaps. Color. Color, definitely. Odor. Costume. Pardon? Costume. Color, odor. Size. <laughs> Whether it dissolves or not. <laughs> <laughs> she says, completely ignoring the rounding sentences. <laughs> okay. And chemical properties. What must a chemical property then be? How it reacts. It has to do with the reaction. What it reacts with, what it produces, those will all be chemical, whether it reacts violently or slowly, those are all chemical properties. Okay? Could you give me some chemical properties of oxygen already? Which is a gas, obviously, which is why I picked it. Well, a chemical property. You're right, its physical property is that it's colorless. Good. What about its chemical properties? Fairly unreactive? Fairly really? Fairly reactive. Fairly reactive? Hmm. Can you think of some reactions? Can you think of some reactions that it undergoes? Rusting. Rusting or any kind of corrosion. So, for example, oxygen, rust, stroke corrosion. Or if it happens fast, it wouldn't be called rust or corrosion, it would be called fast, something plus oxygen yields combustion. So you already know a chemical property of oxygen is that they react with metals to form rust or corrosion, and then they react with other compounds to combust and form the most common oxide. Do you get that? That's a chemical property. Okay. Whereas the physical property would be that oxygen's melting point is la la la, its boiling point is la la la, its color is colorless. It's a gas at room temperature. So state at room temperature. Or actually just at state in general would be a physical property. Um, gases, melting point and boiling point, are they going to be high or low? Low. Low. How did you figure that out so fast? Low because there's a lot, there's less intermolecular forces. That is true. Yeah, yes. At room temperature, they have already boiled. Yes. So therefore, the boiling point must be below room temperature, quite low. Okay. All right. So some concepts about gases. Number one, they always fill their containers. This has to do with those. Lovely drawings that you do that I've talked, how many times have I talked about these drawings? Where the gas or two particles that are spread yeah. apart and they fill their container. Whereas a liquid is, the particles are, gosh, see, here's another example, maybe something you should write down. Liquid, it's like 
connected, but it's not like in the same way. Good. It's not organized. Okay, so they're touching. They're touching, they're on the bottom, because liquids would go to the bottom of the beaker, right? Yeah. So they're at the bottom, they're touching, but they're not in a lot, like they're not in rows and columns. Whereas a solid is in bottom. rows and columns. I have drawn this for you on the board at least four or five times to make a point. These pictures should be there, innately, inertly there. Like you should know them forwards, backwards. So when I say gas, you're already picturing that picture. Why? Because it helps explain almost all of these. Okay? If you can have that in your head, as you're going through these, you make your life a lot easier. Okay, gases are always compressible. That means that exactly. That means you push them down. So what Max just did with his hands, I'm going to do on this little box. If I have this box, and I'm able to push that lid of that box down, what happens to those balls? They're gonna smuck together. So why are gases compressible? Because of these spaces in between. So I can push the gas into that space. Can you think of some examples where you have compressed a gas? Like pumping a ball up? Yeah, like a bicycle pump. <laughs> Right? Like a ball pump bicycle pump, it looks like a T-bar, and you push the T-bar down, right? The gas is being compressed as the volume is decreased, the gas compresses. Everybody okay with that? There's a gas in this balloon. If I take this balloon and I compress it, I, I am compressing the gas in here. What happens to the pressure? If I compress this gas, it goes up, it increases. Okay, we're going to talk a lot about that today. Um, Josh, do you have a question? Oh, I thought it was a hand back there. Okay. Gases diffuse. What is diffusion? From very high concentration to low. Good. Movement from an area of high concentration to low concentration. So for example, do you have a, a, a room in your house that has an air freshener in it? Or some papery thing sat on the side? No, no one? Seriously, like a Glade? Okay, all right. So I'll, in my bathroom and my downstairs, you know, there's just a little, just a little half, what do you call them in this country? Half bath. Right? The toilet sink, that's it, that's all that's in there. The, I have a little sachet of papuri that I've tied onto the door. So when I shut the door, it doesn't spill. right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, I, if I'm coming in and I open the door, the whole bathroom smells like papuri. that papuri. Nice. But if I accidentally leave the door open, right? And I go to the kitchen and I do some stuff and I come back into the bathroom, the bathroom doesn't smell as strong anymore. Because that smell has moved from the area of high concentration, the bathroom, into low concentration, the rest of the house. The rest of the house. Therefore, you don't really smell it very much. Does that make sense? Why do you smell somebody's perfume when you're in the le elevator together? Because that high concentration on that person's body to the low concentration beside you, and it walks over. That's how perfume works. And all day long, it diffuses off of your body from the area of high concentration, wherever you've sprayed it, to low concentration around you. Okay? That's how, that's how air freshers work. That's how perfume works. That's how smells diffuse from the kitchen that, you know, when you're making fish or whatever, and the fish smell eventually will smell the whole house. If you ask my husband, he doesn't like the smell of fish. Okay. So... Diffusion. So gases diffuse. Why? Well, simply because they fill their container. So at first, the container was just the bathroom in my little papuri sachet. And all of a sudden, the container is now every open doored room in the house. That's a bigger container, and gases will fill it, but there's still the same amount of particles. So you don't smell them because they're so spread out. Okay? Um, that, so I guess this is this lid moving it upwards. 
And as I move it upwards, then these circles can move further apart. Okay, so diffusion. And gases' temperature affects volume as well as pressure. All these three things are related, of which you kind of already told me. As I squish this balloon and I decrease the volume, the pressure increase, right? If I were to heat up a pop bottle in the car, left it in the car on a hot summer's day, and I go back at the end of the baseball game, I go back and I want a bit of a drink, that pop bottle is now like puffed out, right? And when I open it, it makes this big psh as all the gas that's increased in that pressure leaves and the pop itself is now flat because the gas has gone. Okay, which is carbon, that is the gas it's in, yes. Okay, so the, that's, that's the overview of what gases are, are like, the, their properties. Yes? What does the temperature have to do with the pressure? Like when it's hot as it So when I increase the temperature, the pressure increases. Okay? Yep. And we're going to talk about why, and so that's all the theory behind it, but we'll get, we'll get there by the end of the unit. The first one I want to look at today is Boyle's Law. So Boyle's Law, Boyle's was a scientist that studied how these three things, temperature, volume, and pressure, kind of all affected each other, okay? How they are related. But of course, a good scientist holds something constant, changes one thing, and looks at one thing to have been changed, right? You can't look at, you can't change everything at the same time, you'll never come up with a good science experiment. So you've got to keep, so he kept the temperature constant and looked at volume and pressure only. When I change the volume of that balloon, how does the pressure change? Okay, that's what he did. So I need to somehow scroll this down without, I think if I do that, good, and then I do that, that works, only too many. And in fact, I'm just going to go over here. Okay, so Boyle's is law. So the first thing that you need to get your head around with Boyle's is law is um, the units of pressure. The units of pressure, Boyle's is law. So you know when you see a sentence in chemistry and it's like blah, 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 five grams, blah, 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 blah. What's that five grams? What do you know about that five grams? Mass. It's mass. And so all of a sudden your brain starts thinking about all these things that have to do with mass, okay? So it's important for us to know the unit so that we can identify what thing we're talking about, what measurement. So kilopascals is the SI unit. Like miles isn't, but meters is an SI unit. Okay, grams is, but pounds is not an SI unit. System international, meaning metric, okay? So kilopascals is one thing that I would talk about that I could change to just pascals or millipascals or centipascals or megapascals, or et cetera, okay? Atmosphere is an older fashioned way, like I suppose like miles versus me uh, meters, right? We have atmospheres versus kilopascals. So atmospheres is an old fashioned way. One atmosphere of pressure is the pressure at sea. So that you understand where they came up with the atmosphere, right? Nice, easy one. And you can go from there depending on the atmosphere's pressure. Okay, so whenever you, you see 1.2 atmospheres of pressure, you know it's a pressure unit, right? And then the third unit that you have to identify is this millimeters of mercury. And at room temperature and pressure, we should have uh, 101 kilopascals Pardon me, I mean, uh, not room temperature and pressure, I mean sea level, 101 kilopascals, and at sea level, we should have 760 millimeters of mercury. Okay, now that might seem like an odd unit, but it has to do with this apparatus, which is the first apparatus to measure pressure. So, you know that um, sulfur mountain? You can take a gondola up, there's no, in Banff, there's no Starbucks there, and then you can walk up a little bit around the boardwalk to a weather station up at the tippy top of the one of the mountains. 
Yes, you've been there, I would hope. Okay, so at the top of this silver mountain is a weather station, not active anymore. It's now like almost a little museum. You can look inside the glass to see what his little room would have looked like. And he took measurements, which helped us identify climate um, patterns and weather patterns and then be able to do predictions. So he would have had one of these little apparatuses. Essentially, it's a cup with a test tube inside and the cup is filled with mercury, okay? And when the pressure of the atmosphere increases and this pushes down on the mercury, what happens to that mercury? It's gonna go off the tube. And if that tube had little measurements on it, in millimeters, you could see how many millimeters of mercury I had up the tube. Okay, so that's where that unit came from. So every time you see one of these units, you're thinking that must be a measurement of pressure. Everybody okay? Okay. So, uh, oh. the other thing that we need to learn is the difference between STP and ATP in our introduction. So STP, standard temperature and pressure, eventually we'll get there, there we go. And SATP, standard ambient, which is room temperature and pressure. Okay. So standard temperature and pressure, we'll, we'll worry about this in a minute. Well, by a minute, I mean at the end of the unit. Um, standard temperature pressure is at zero degrees Celsius and 101.3 kilopascals, whereas room temperature sh certainly isn't zero, okay? It's 25 and 100 kilopascals. And again, we'll talk about the molar volume at the end of the unit, but I wanted them all on the same list. Everybody okay with that? Okay, so that might come up when we're starting to do our math questions, and then you can refer to this and that will help you along. Okay, so up to the meat of today, Boyle's Law. So Boyle's Law said, as the pressure on a gas increases, the volume on a gas decreases. Isn't that what you told me about my balloon? As I decrease the volume of the balloon, the pressure increases. Go back to the tire, the, the ball, the tire, what did you call that thing? The tire pump, yeah. right? That you're using to pump up your basketball. Put a, put a finger on the end of that nozzle so you're trapping the gas in there, it's a closed system. And now decrease the volume of that pump. What happens to the pressure inside? What happens to the pressure on your finger that you're feeling? Increases, it gets harder and harder and harder to push it down, right? To compress the gas. So as you decrease the volume, the pressure increases. That makes sense. You didn't need a scientist to tell you that. But what you needed a scientist to do is to do a whole, of, whole pile of experiments and see if there's a relationship between that. Is there a number that you can put? And actually, he said, yes. If I decrease the volume by half, my pressure will double. And if I decrease the volume by a third, the pressure triples. And if I decrease the volume by a quarter, the pressure would quadruple. quadruple. That, that fraction and whole number is called inversely proportional, okay? Inversely pur proportional, there it is, proportional. Okay, just gonna, mm -hmm. so what does that look like mathematically? Mathematically, it looks like this. Big P, this symbol here means proportional to one over volume. That's the inverse part, like an inverse fraction. Don't worry too much about the math here, because the other class didn't really love me using the words like inversely proportional, proportional. Okay, have you ever seen this symbol before? Okay, so this symbol means this. I'd love to put an equal sign here, okay? 
I'd love to put an equal sign here. And if I put an equal sign here, and I put some numbers for my volume, like let's say that that, what do you think the pressure of that volume is, uh, what, what do you think the pressure of that balloon is right now? Sure. Approximately. How many kilopascals would you guess that balloon would be? A hundred. Why did you pick a hundred? It's standard ambient. Good, because it's standard ambient temperature and pressure. Right? So it's about, it's going to be the same pressure as, yeah, and by the way, that's why it stays blown out, because the same amount of pressure pushing out is the same amount of pressure pushing in. So that's why, that's why it doesn't continue expanding, and that's why it doesn't collapse on us. It's got the same pressure against the wall as it does pushing this way. In the, if I could stick my thumb inside that balloon, that pressure is the same as that pressure. And that's why it stays like that. If I increase this pressure by like say blowing into it, that pushes it out and the balloon gets bigger. Right? Okay, so that's how a balloon stays afloat. If the volume, so we're thinking the pressure at the moment is 100 kilopascals. And the volume is, say, one liter, just to make it easy. Is one over one liter, does that equal 100? One over one? No, it equals one. One. <laughs> so I, I can't have it equal. Because the pressure doesn't equal one divided by the volume. It doesn't equal. So I have to have this funny symbol, which means it doesn't equal, but they are related to each other. Okay, and that's this funny symbol. Right? So what if the pressure wasn't one liter anymore, but I squished it, like we've done, to half a liter? Okay, I've squished this to half a liter. What <coughs> happens to the pressure, you said? It increases. So the pressure increases. Is the pressure one divided by half, which is two? Is the pressure now two kilopascals? Do they e can I put an equal sign there? Is that pressure now two? No, it's more like 200, but not two. So I can't put an equal sign there. I have to say that they are related to each other. Okay, that's what that funny symbol means. Okay, so let's play with this. One over one half, the pressure is now 200, one divided by 100. Oh, pardon me. Oh, never mind. That's so we have the formula, which I haven't done yet. Okay, we'll get there. Hold on. So, sorry, I was jumping ahead. Other class, this is the danger of teaching the two in a row. So, one, there, there must be some kind of number that's involved here called a constant. I'm going to skip over this part and jump down to this part because the rest of this lab today has to do with the constant. So, I'll go back to that in a second. But he said, look, for the same situation, let me just go back and get my board clear again. For the same situation, I should have, I can set up this, uh, this relationship. P1, V1 equals P2, V2. This is the same balloon. This is situation one. The pressure and volume of that balloon as it sat at the table. Then in the second situation, the pressure and volume after I've squeezed it. <coughs> okay, so Emma already told us the pressure of that balloon set at the table is probably about 100 kilopascals. And I said, let's, let's call the volume one liter so that our math is nice and easy. And I'm gonna squish this to half the volume. Okay, so now what is the new volume in the second situation? Isaac? Isaiah? Zero point five liters. Everybody okay with that? And can I solve for my new pressure? This is where I was going when I was doing the math before I remembered you hadn't been taught that yet. Can I figure out the second pressure now? Can I figure out the new pressure of this balloon? Yes, yeah. what is it? Spencer? 200. 200. So for those of you that didn't love that in your head, 100 times 1 divided by 0 0.5 will solve for that unknown P2. And that P2 then is, just type that in your calculator, 200 kilopascals. 
So we already kind of knew inherently that, that decreasing the volume increased the pressure. But Boyle showed us that if I have the pressure, I double the volume. Uh, pardon me. If I have the volume, I double the pressure. If I third, I triple, etc. And we could do the math all day to prove that to you. Okay? Until the balloon pops. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? So tomorrow, we'll do a whole lot of these and get our heads comfortable with that math. Okay? But today, we're going to talk just about Boyle's experiments. How exactly did he see that that's inversely proportional? What does that look like in a graph? And this constant, because of course, if they don't equal, they must be related by a constant, okay, a number. And that, how that number plays into the slope. And I know you're all looking at me like you have no, you have, like I am speaking Greek. I know that, that's fine. By the time you work your way through this lab, you will feel comfortable with what a constant is and how scientists come up with it, okay? So, treat it as an exploring thing. Please. Thank you. I'll go over here. Okay, so. Oh, no, it's still. Okay, so Boyle's Law Graphing Lab. So, what we're going to do is we're going to discover the meaning of the constant K by pretending we're Boyle, actually. And here's what Boyle observed according to this graph, and according to this paper, anyway. Boyle decided that he had some volumes and he found the pressure of that balloon at that volume. What did he have to keep constant? The temperature. So if it, for all of these balloon experiments, the temperature was the same. Okay, and he just changed the volume of the balloon and then measured the pressure that that balloon had, but they're all at the same temperature. Okay, because every good scientist only changes one thing and looks for one thing, right? Can't change a whole lot of things at the same time because then you have no idea what the result is due to. So, you're gonna, the first thing is graph pressure versus volume. And I found the last class was not very happy with knowing how to do a scientific graph. Are you better? Yes. Oh, tell me how to do it then. Start with your labels. Start with my labels, okay? So normally, what do you put at the bottom label? Uh, X or uh, time. Normally time. I don't have time here. Uh, y pressure versus t volume. It's like X and Y. Yeah. Stuff so you think because of math, this is the X column and this is the Y column? Usually. Yeah. OK, well, we can stick with that. So we can put pressure down here. In science, what you put down here is normally what you are changing. And what you put on the y-axis is what you are measuring. So if I change the concentration, I'd make that concentration. If I'm measuring how much mass of precipitate was formed, that would go on this side. But here, there's no like blah, 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 blah. So let's go back to our balloon. In our balloon experiment, what, what are we changing? Volume. volume. We are controlling the volume. And what are we observing? The pressure. So actually, although this would be x and y columns and, and you, there is no blah, 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 so you don't really know what this experiment is changing, if we stay with our balloon experiment, then it would be the opposite. We would put the volume down here because that's the thing we are changing and the pressure on the side. What else do I need for my graph? That's right, isn't it? Yeah. Intervals. Okay, intervals. What do you mean by that? Like, like goes by fives or twos or. Right. So our our you increments. Have a, you can have a break in the graph. You, uh, we don't tend to do breaks in science, but we also don't have to start at zero in science. Okay. So our first, our lowest measurement on the volume is zero point five one. You could very well start at zero point five. If you're not looking at zero volume, what pressure does that have? There's no nece you don't necessarily have to go to that value. Does that make sense? If you want, if you're more comfortable, you can stay at zero because these are quite low, low numbers. But if my concentrations were 
um, you know, I suppose constitution doesn't really work, but um, if my temperature was 210 Kelvin, 220 Kelvin, 200, I wouldn't want to start at zero, otherwise my whole graph would be way up here. So there's no point in having all of this stuff, there's no need to start at zero, okay? So, but for here you could start at zero because the number is so close to zero, and then you're right, equal increments. I don't write 0 0.51, 0 0.61, 0 0.94, right? Equal increments, equal increments up the side. What do I need with my volume? Um, units. units, thank you. And Josh said a title. We could put a title. You could just put X versus air letters. No, that's not specific enough. This is what I tell my students. If you were to take all your graphs from the whole high school, like your graphs from high school, and drop them in your bedroom, you should be able to decide, oh, that graph goes with this lab, that graph goes with this lab. That's how good your title should be. Okay? The graph doesn't help you much. And trust me, I've read many titles that say the graph. All right, so perhaps we could put Graphing Boyle's Law as our title because then we know that the, the title for the graph is a title for that sheet and they can go together nice and easily. Okay, and that's number one. Graph it, number one, easy. Number two, however, you'll see that you put a curve for number one. So number two says, Scientists often, when they get that kind of curve that you're going to get, straighten it by making another column here. I just have to rub that out for a second. Making another column of which that column is 1 over V. So I take this number and I divide it. 1 divided by 0 0.5 which is, oh, I did it earlier, or 1.5, pardon me, 1 is a, divided by 1.5, which is 0. Point, I believe it was 6.7. In fact, it's probably still in the Six, yeah, 6.7. Okay, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that'll help you get started on 2A. Okay, and again, you're all looking really like I'm speaking Greek, because when you get there, you'll sort it out. Junior class change. I have some graph paper for you to borrow, and then you can get started on your graph. Any questions? Okay. So, for, do we do one over V on the same graph?